Welcome to Vineyard Milwaukee. Today is Palm Sunday, so this is a joyous time for us to, to, to worship Jesus. And this, this is um, from John chapter 12. Uh, and this says, The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Let's, let's stand today and let's welcome Jesus into this place and into our hearts. Let's, let's lift, it, lift up the name of Jesus. Get it out. 
Let all things rise and bless your name. All things may Just 
Jesus, we lift up your name. God, you are good. We lift you up. Holy Spirit, would you come in this place and speak to our hearts. Wrap us in your arms of love. I pray that your gentle voice would turn our hearts to you. It's your kindness, Lord, that leads us to repentance. We turn away from our sinful ways and we turn towards you. You are making all things new. Come and make us new. Come and make our hearts new. You are good. You are good. Amen. You can be seated. Our first passage brings us to the burial site of the crucified Christ. John 19, 41 and 42. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, which, in which no one had ever been laid to rest. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. 
I think it's a challenge to consider this story without our future knowledge. We are living 2,000 years in the future here, and we know the ending. We know a Sunday, um, the resurrection. But for the disciples, they had no idea. So let's try to imagine what it might have been like for them to watch Jesus die and then to see him buried. The same Jesus who performed miracles, silenced storms, walked on water, cast out demons, raised the dead, and now himself has been put to death, his lifeless body hanging on a cross as he breathed his final words, it is finished. Hard to believe the job was finished at that point. I wonder if some of the followers of Jesus felt like he just gave up, uh, stopped fighting against their oppressors. Jesus had tried to tell his closest followers many times what it meant to be the savior of the world, that the Messiah would have to die. Um, but still, most of them were hoping for a revolution, a political revolution, where they would be set free, liberated from Roman oppression and Roman rule. But instead, the leader of their radical group was put to death, murdered by his critics. Who would be next? And then, as they watched their rabbi, friend, mentor die, buried, put to death, put to death and buried in a tomb, they must have been devastated. They did not have any thought or hope that he would rise again, even though he maybe through metaphor said that he would. I don't know if he actually said that he was going to rise physically, or maybe they just didn't think that was possible. Um, but from their angle, they saw the hope of the world, dead and buried. Have you ever had to bury a dream? Of course you have, you know, if you've been on this planet for any amount of time, you've, you've lived long enough probably to have had a dream that died. How do we make sense of losing a dream, especially when we think it's from God, when it's finally dead and it feels like it needs to be buried? The view from above, above ground looks bleak. But Jesus encourages us to look underground, in John 12, 23 and 24, Jesus was talking to his own disciples. He said, the hour has come when the Son of Man is to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So he is saying that his death and burial is like a seed being planted that when the seed dies in the earth, its form is transformed, and when the roots break through and the leaves shoot up, there will be fruit and increase, but the seed itself becomes something other. The author of 40 Days of Decrease, a Dr. Alicia Brick Cole, shares the following in another book called Anonymous. Consider the growth of a plant. Before a gardener can enjoy a plant's fruit, she must tenderly and strategically attend to the root. So a plant's birth begins with its burial. The gardener commits a generally unremarkable seed to the silence of the soil, where it sits in stillness and lightness, lightlessness, hidden by smothering dirt. Just when it appears as though death is imminent, its seeming decay reveals new life. The seed becomes less and yet more of its former self in that the transformation takes hold of the darkness and reaches for the sun. All that is to come rests greatly on the plant's ability to tightly and sightlessly develop roots in unseen places. So, for anyone here who has a dream that is dying or dead, you may feel like you are in the darkness with no light and you cannot see what might come next. And when our own dreams are buried, we wait and we trust that roots are being developed in unseen places. Though above ground, we can see nothing. Maybe we feel nothing and maybe we hope for nothing. So, 
Shall we go deeper then? Deeper underground? So what happened when Jesus was planted in a garden tomb? What happened to the dream of the disciples when he was literally dead and buried? Early church leaders suggest that in the short time after his death, Jesus actually descended into hell before the resurrection. So for example, Paul writes, therefore it is a said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself captive. He gave gifts to the people. And he says parenthetically, when he says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. Um, Peter also said, for Christ suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he also went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison who in former times did not obey. So without getting too heavy into the theological, I think it might be valuable to consider what was it Jesus was doing after he died, but before he rose. And it turns out this idea has been explored extensively in an extra canonical text known as the Gospel of Nicodemus, or formerly the Acts of Pontius Pilate. Uh, this, this text was brought to my attention through a sermon by Brad Jersack called The Death of Death, which you can find on YouTube. Um, and there might be a slide for that if you want to find it, or come ask me, or just search it. Um, but I do recommend it for anyone who might think about death or w wonder that they might die one day. Um, it's a really interesting and uh, thoughtful sermon about death. But I do want to take a few minutes to tell you this story. I have not read the whole text, and there's parts of it that are very weird. Actually, it's very weird. Uh, and I'm even going to read some parts that are very weird. <laughs> um, but there's a few chapters toward the end of this incredible story um, that are a lot of fun. It, it, this is like an incredible piece of speculative fan fiction. Um, or maybe it happened, because the legends might be true. But it borrows heavily from the Gospels and the Hebrew prophets and the Psalms and uh, Handel's Messiah. And it is um, a really impressive piece of literature that reads an awful lot like a Shakespearean comedy. So settle in and enjoy this because it's fun and fabulous and also significant. Just because it's fun doesn't mean I'm not very serious right now. Um, so we'll start near the end, about chapter 15, which the subtext of the, the, the heading of this chapter says, a quarrel between Satan and the Prince of Hell concerning the expected arrival of Christ in hell. Now, when they refer to hell, they are referring to the abode of the dead. This is not the place of eternal suffering as um, most evangelical Christians have grown to think about the word hell. It's really just the abode of the dead, where people go when they die. Um, the Prince of Hell, sometimes referred to as Beelzebub, I don't think his name really matters, but he's basically the same archetype as Hades is in Greek mythology or Pluto in Roman um, mythology. So just think about the guy who owns and is the guardian of the abode of the dead. And Satan is referenced as the prince and the captain of death. So these two are talking. And Satan says to the prince of hell, Prepare to receive Jesus of Nazareth himself, who boasted that he was the son of God, but even he was afraid of death and said, my soul is sorrowful even to death. And Jesus did in fact say that. So Satan is bragging about the death of Jesus, which Satan claims to have completely orchestrated along with all of its horrors. And the prince of hell is like, oh, that is impressive, but wait a minute. Isn't Jesus of Nazareth the same guy who stole Lazarus from me four days after he was dead and was rotten and stinking from death? And he's like, oh no, don't bring that guy here because he'll set everyone free who has been imprisoned by sin and unbelief and he'll transport them all to everlasting life. End scene. <laughs> Chapter 16. Christ's arrival at hell's gates the confusion thereupon, he descends into hell. 
All right. So while Satan and the prince of hell are arguing, they hear a voice like thunder. Lift up your gates and be you lifted up. The king of glory is coming in. And the prince of hell tells Satan, well, you're a warrior. Go fight the king of glory. And I don't think Satan does, but he leaves. And the prince of hell tries to get the saints in, in hell to fight on behalf of hell. But the saints yell in anger, open up your gates so the king of glory may come in. Uh, those of you who know Handel's Messiah are already getting that song in your head. Um, and then the divine prophet David cried out saying, hey, when I was on earth, didn't I prophesy about this? I did indeed. I said, oh, that the men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he has broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. And then my boy Isaiah says, hey, didn't I also prophesy to you when I was alive on the earth? Remember when I said, the dead shall live again, and they shall rise again who are in their graves, and shall rejoice who are in the earth, for the dew which is from the Lord shall bring deliverance to them. And I said in another place, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? Amen. All right. And the thunderous voice repeats, Lift up your gates, O princes, and be ye lifted up, ye gates of hell. The king of glory is coming in. And the prince of hell, pretending to be ignorant, says, Who is this king of glory? And those of you who are uh, familiar with Handel's Messiah are getting that song in your head now. Um, and David replies, Oh, I understand the words of that voice because I spoke them by his spirit. And now, as I have said above, I say to you now, below, the Lord is strong and powerful. The Lord is mighty in battle. He is the king of glory, and he is the Lord in heaven and on earth. And he has looked down to hear the groans of the prisoners and to set loose those that are appointed to death. And now, you filthy and stinking prince of hell, open up your gates that the king of glory may enter in, for he is the Lord of heaven and earth. And while David was saying this, the mighty Lord appeared in the form of a man and enlightened those places which ever before had been in darkness and broke asunder the chains which before could not be broken. And with his invincible power, visited those who sat in deep darkness by iniquity and the shadow of death because of sin. So we come to this ending of this story. Death and the devils, in great horror at Christ's coming, he tramples on death, seizes the prince of hell, and takes Adam with him to heaven. So Christ takes Adam by the hand. So, so Jesus goes through hell. He's looking, he's looking at all the saints, everyone who died before he was able to uh, die and be raised again. And he's looking for Adam, you know, the original person, Adam and Eve. And he goes and he grabs Adam by the hand and the rest of the saints all join hands and they ascend with him to paradise. And Jesus stretched forth his hand and said, said come to me. All my saints who were created in my image, who were condemned by the tree of forbidden fruit and by the devil and death, live now by the wood of my cross. The devil, the prince of this world, is overcome and death is conquered. And then all the saints were joined together under the hand of the Most High God. And the Lord Jesus laid hold on Adam's hand and said to him, Peace to you and all your descendants, which are mine. Pretty righteous, right? And you know what it's called when Jesus descended into hell to free the righteous held captive? This is called the harrowing of hell. Pretty metal, right? <laughs> I know some people become very uncomfortable when you talk about hell, and you say that word so many times, and you think about Jesus, the perfect one, descending into the abode of the dead, into hell. And some Christian traditions actually omit the line in the Apostles' Creed, which uh, reads, he descended into hell. 
and skip to the he rose again on the third day part. Um, but I think this part is important. Um, even Jesus says through John's vision in the book of Revelation, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I'm alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys to death and to Hades. Now, how could Jesus get the keys to Hades if he didn't go there and get them? Um, I don't think hell's landlord keeps a lockbox. So, why am I sharing this marvelous story with you from an extra canonical uh, book called The Gospel of Nicodemus? Because remember, above ground, all hope was lost. On the surface, it felt like the darkest, bleakest hour. But underground, deep underground, Jesus was bringing freedom and eternal life to prisoners. And Dr. Alicia also observed that the disciples, even in their darkest moment, were just hours from their greatest joy and triumph, but they didn't know that. And while the time we need to wait might be longer than some hours or a day, um, God is the same God. And you know what? Even above ground, we can still look for signs of life. The very moment Jesus died, the curtain that separated humans from God was torn, and the tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And after his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. What? I mean, I remember hearing at some point that some people raised from the dead when Jesus raised from the dead, but even before he raised from the dead, the tombs were open and there were people coming out. I, that is wild. What do we even make sense of that except that anything is possible? So while you wait, trusting in the God who defeated death, look for signs of life. So what if your dream seems impossible to resurrect? There are a lot of reasons a dream might feel truly dead and gone. Maybe you don't have the money or resources to pursue a particular vocation, or maybe someone you loved is gone or a relationship has ended. Maybe your body is changing, you feel too old, you're sick, you have commitments that take up time and energy or it's become too painful to hope, and disappointment has become comfortable. And I'm sure there's other impossibilities that I'm not even thinking of now. But when a dream is from the God who loves you and has plans for you, who wants you to have a life filled with meaning and purpose, the essence of that dream that reflects a part of you that God has designed can be resurrected and fulfilled, even if the shell of the dream seems to have died. So, for example, I'll share an example of a dream of mine um, that doesn't cause me pain to share. So, before I graduated, I had this uh, ex extensive dream to start a nonprofit center in Milwaukee. Um, a friend and colleague of mine, we used to daydream about this all the time for years, and we had like notes apps going and all of our ideas and people's names and we had like collected all of these thoughts. We wanted to create a community mental health center in Milwaukee. We wanted to serve the poor, the people of Milwaukee, um, offer therapy, groups, community, uh, other healing practices to um, anyone who needed it who suffered from any kind of mental illness or addiction and uh, trauma. And when we told people about this idea, the responses were incredibly encouraging. Many, many people would say things like, wow, I think that's really going to happen. Um, and I can tell you, that is not going to happen. <laughs> uh, today, I, like, I am very, very certain that this is not going to happen for a variety of reasons within me and without me. Um, but I am fairly certain that the essence of this dream that is connected to me, and is more, more so the essence of the dream that is connected to God's heart, um, to see the people of our city liberated from trauma, depression, anxiety, addiction, that dream will live again. Um, even though I have no idea how. 
So how do you know if a dream is from God? Well, as some say, if everyone in my dream is about me, is me, and everyone in your dream is you, then everyone in God's dream is God? Um, so does your dream look like God? Is it living? Is it loving? Is it beautiful and creative? Does it set people free? Those dreams can be resurrected. Those dreams that you have lost will live again. Let us join together in communion right now. Um, because communion is when we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And the Lord's death, as we have observed, brings life. Um, so the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, oh wait, let's take the bread together. Here we go. And in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. So, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Hell is still being harrowed right now. Prisoners are being set free and the dead are being raised. If you have a dream that has died, if you are feeling like a prisoner or you are captive or dead or dying or something in you needs to be set free, come get prayer today. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes because the Lord's death brings life. Be set free. Be my 
shadow, you won't light up, man, you won't find me coming after me. There's no wall you won't break down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up.
wanting it, please go ahead and go go back or grab somebody and say, would you pray for me? So have a blessed week. See you on Easter. Or see you Good Friday. Yes, 7 p.m. We know that you will come through.